Hello, it's Ricardo, and welcome back to episode 6 of Star Trek The 25th Anniversary Enhanced Edition Playthrough. A retro game, a retro adventure game, where games were not just a corporate pocketbook. There's no DLC here, there's nothing you can buy to try and win. It's just good old point and click, good old fashioned adventuring. This is episode 6 in a 7 episode um, journey. So this is the penultimate epi episode called That Old Devil Moon. Now you take control of Captain James Kirk, McCoy, Spock, and a red shirt, and also the people on the bridge of the USS Enterprise. That Old Devil Moon is all about a strange power reading that has been detected from a large asteroid approaching a pre-warp star system. How quintessential Star Trek is this? The Prime Directive is going to be all over this. The Enterprise discovers an ancient nuclear missile base that does not realise that the war has ended 1,000 years earlier and must prevent it from destroying the native civilization a second time. How cool is that? How ethical is that? How quintessential is that of a Star Trek episode? The game, with its seven episodes, plays like, as we've said before, you know, a Star Trek series. Um, it's all going to be tied up, though, in the final episode, which will be called Vengeance. That will be coming out next. So check out the playlist for that. Um, also check out the other videos in the series that take me through um, the entire walkthrough at 100% for each one of these videos. You want to get 100%? Point, click, tricorder, scan, look, speak to everything and everyone and you will get 100%. It really is achievable. The starship combat, I quite like in this. It's simplistic. You can have it with a bridge view. You can have it with a full screen view. You know, I, I like it. I really like this game. Anyway, you've probably already gathered that. If you haven't already done so, click that like and subscribe button. And if you haven't already done that as well, then look at that notification icon and ring that notification bell. And that'll let you know when I'm putting more videos like this on YouTube. Now, I'm not going to wrap it all the way through it. Let's let the story unfold. Message from Starfleet, sir. On screen, Lieutenant. The Enterprise will proceed to the Alpha Proxima system. While the indigenous race on Proxima 3 has not reached a technological level commensurate with entering the Federation, and therefore under the protection of the prime directive of non-interference, we do maintain a discrete monitoring satellite. It has picked up activity from an asteroid in an elliptical orbit. You are to investigate without interfering with life on the planet. According to the library computer, the Alpha Proxima system has five planets and an asteroid belt. A large asteroid is heading towards the inner planets and should pass close by Proxima 3. It passes through the interior of the system once every 200 years. The people of Proxima 3 call it Scythe, the same name as their god of war. God of war, Mr. Spock? Isn't that a bit surprising from a people whose technology matches 20th century Earth? Considering the level of warfare during that century, I'm surprised that it is Earth that did not have a god of war. In any case, about a millennium ago, Proxima III suffered a globally devastating war. Blew themselves back to the Stone Age, Mr. Spock? Late Bronze Age, Ensign. They rebuilt their world in half the time it had taken to get there originally. But the Armageddon was mythologized as a battle between the Sofs and Lucas. In that war, the planet was raised, and all the gods died except Sai. He had rained fury down upon the world, then went off on a long dance of victory. His return is a time for worldwide soul-searching and atonement. And Scythe returns, and our monitoring station picks up activity. It would seem that we should proceed to Alpha Proxima and scan Scythe. Entering standard orbit. A sensor scan of Psi reveals surface features consistent with damage left by a nuclear attack. It would seem to have been a target during Proxima's war. Psi rained fury down on the planet and then left on a dance of victory. 
A missile base, Captain? It would seem to make sense. Captain, I just monitored a narrow beam message from Scythe to Proxima 3. I don't have it all. I just caught a bit of the initial burst. I'm attempting a translation, but it appears to be a computer code. Any response from the planet? The Proxtrites will not have the equipment necessary to understand and reply to that code for another 25.6 years at their present rate of development. Alpha Proxima, star system with five planets, Alpha Proxima 3, Proxtray, and Alpha Proxima 4, Gazel, are both inhabited worlds. Proxtray, the third planet in the Alpha Proxima system. This Class M planet is widely habitable except for zones of extreme radioactivity on the southern continent. About 1,000 years ago, the two dominant political systems, the Lugers and the Sovs, engaged in a nuclear war that resulted in the deaths of three quarters of the world's population through direct or collateral damage. Proxtray's current civilization is non-spacefaring and does not have contact with the Federation. Lokers, one of the two ancient cultures of Proxtray, see Sops. The Lokers believe that a man who made the most of his ability was a god. Their individualism put themselves at odds with the communitarianism of the Sops. The Lokers used base three. Their organization was based on units of three, making up sets of 99. The number 99 was known to have religious importance to them. Sofs, one of the two ancient races of Proxtray. They lived in a highly advanced culture that valued the community ahead of the individual, which put them in conflict with the Lukers. The Sofs used base four in their mathematics, and their organization was based on units of four to make up sets of 100. Scythe, a large asteroid in an elliptical orbit in the Alpha Proxima system. Spectral analysis of its composition indicates that it has minimal atmosphere and that it was once a moon of the planet Proxtray, hurled out of its orbit by a catastrophe. The 17th letter of the Luker alphabet is named Scythe, probably not by coincidence. Spock, come with me. Mr. Scott, you have the car. Mr. Scott? Aye, we've had some slight problems with the transporters. We didn't notice anything beaming down. Just a glitch in the main transporter program. Mr. Kyle is loading a bag up and we're performing tests. The transporters will be down for about an hour. That will still give us plenty of time, Scotty. I know. I have the lads in engineering doing a complete overhaul of the ship systems. Good, Mr. Scott. I'll keep you posted. Kirk out. This looks like a heavy-duty security door built into the side of a hill on this moon. There are many rocks here. These stones look like faces. These stones resemble those on Earth, on Easter Island. Stone monoliths of faces are a common artistic expression in evolving cultures. Like the faces on Vandu, too. Even the animal face art of the Orion post-decadence movement is similar. I never realized the Orions ever got past decadence. They hadn't the last time I was there. As expected, Captain, the source of power emanations lies beyond that door. A power source that has lasted millennia and endured major catastrophes. That's fascinating, Mr. Spock. Do you have Vulcan blood, Ensign? No, sir. The rocks have a high quantity of triphosphorus silver in them. Large quantities of atmosphere are being circulated through these rocks. I would guess there are storage units within this satellite which are constantly replacing the atmosphere that is lost because of this moon's weak gravity. Which means that this moon might still be inhabited, Mr. Spock. We have detected no signs of life, Captain, but the possibility does exist. You retrieve a rock.
Captain, I'm afraid we've got a wee problem here. What is it, Scotty? There is some sort of virus in the main computer. Our phasers and tractor beams have been disabled, and there's no way we're getting them back in three hours. There goes our backup plan. Do what you can, Mr. Scott. Aye, I will, Captain. I may yet have a trick or two that I can pull, but don't count on any miracles. Isolate that virus. That's your number one priority. That it is, Captain. We'll keep you informed. Scott out. The door still appears to be in operating condition. Working display panel, Captain. There is power running to the keypad. I see you deduced that 10200 in the Lucre's base 3 was equal to their sacred number 99. Report, Scotty. How are things going? About as badly as a killed in a blast furnace, Captain. Wait a minute. Lieutenant Nuhura has some news for you. The virus came from our sensor sweep of the moon's computers. We believe we have analyzed the memory sectors it attacked. Well done, Uhura. I wish I could take credit for it. It was Mr. Kyle who found the pattern. We are attacking it with antivirus programs. Computer science sounds more like medicine every day. If we had a doctor as good with computers as you are with patients, we'd be having a lot fewer problems. Finally someone who appreciates me. Keep working at it, Uhura. Kirk out. The interior of the security lock is unremarkable and well-preserved. This keypad is fully functional and controls the door. Its entry code is in base 3. This door is similar to the one on the outside of the secure lock, except that it has not weathered over the years. Electrical panels indicate the keypad on the right controls the door. A computer terminal, Captain. It uses the Lucre alphabet. I think I can decipher it. The console reports the following. Welcome to Orbital Missile Base. Codename, Psy. This base has been operational for the past week. It has completed one successful fire mission. Estimation of success is at 22 over 100. 22 percent? That's very low. Hardly something to brag about. Doctor, in base 3, 22 divided by 100 is equivalent to 8 out of 9, or 88%. I would think that quite satisfactory, given this base's probable mission of destroying the soft forces on Proxtree. It says the base has been operational for a week, but this has been here for a thousand years. If the Lukers built this base with a clock that told the time by measuring the moon's rotational speed, or the gravitational forces generated by Proxtree and the Sun, the computer may have calculated only a week of time has passed since its first action. I might be able to learn more with another look at the console. There is a substantial amount of data here, but in summary, Scythe was created by the Lukers as a launching platform for missiles to keep the Softs subjugated to their influence. The Softs managed to infiltrate the base, However, their actions triggered Scythe's auto-attack mechanisms and initiated a holocaust that nearly annihilated the planet. One soft strike did, in fact, hit the moon and deflected it from its orbit. It has been dormant since then. So why has the base been activated again? Given the damage to the moon, its slow rotation and orbit, it has never realized the war is over. On this pass, for the first time, it has detected radio wave transmissions from Proxtree. Because it does not recognize them, it assumes the softs are still active. Its transmission to the planet, I would assume, was some sort of a check beacon to see if it should continue its mission. Jim, let's return to the ship and blast this place to destroy its weapons. Doctor, this moon is a god to the people down there. If we destroy it, we will violate the Prime Directive. Spock is right, Bones. Spock, what are the chances that we could decode the transmission and send a stop code to the base? In trinary or decimal? Spock! 1.327 million to 1. Provided the archaeological studies about Lucas' languages are correct, 
Our other option is to get into this base and see if we can bring the computers down. Fascinating. If the Federation language studies were correct, the ideograph for the word scythe in the Lucre's language is the 17th symbol in their alphabet that corresponds with 122 in base 3. Captain, we have a cure for the computer virus. Well done, Uhura. I modified Cathral C to exclusively attack the Lucre virus. They annihilated each other, Captain. Fascinating, Lieutenant. The Klingons aren't going to be happy to learn that they helped us. How about the phasers and tractor beams? We may get the tractor beams online in time, Captain. I'm afraid even the backup phaser transmission codes were affected. We could destroy some missiles manually, but if this complex decides to launch more than ten missiles at a time... Understood. The ball is in our court. We'll give it our best shot. Kirk out. This door is made from remarkably dense alloys. Even our most powerful phaser rifle or welder would not be able to penetrate it. The thing must be almost as tough as a starship hull. Indeed, Ensign, and considerably thinner. A remarkable achievement in metallurgical engineering. This panel has a slot in it rather than a keypad. The slot bears traces of triphosphorus silver, and power is currently running to it. I am recording the pattern of this lock into my tricorder. Can't say I like the decor. The Lukers did not leave behind many examples of their architecture. I can see why. Captain, with the 3K AG content of the surface rocks and the tricorder scan of the pattern inside the lock, I believe the laser drill can be used to fashion the ID card needed to open the sealed door in the other chamber. The drill is unremarkable, except its aiming component is corroded and frozen in place. Unlike the surface rocks, the ore here is unremarkable. A storage box of some kind. I detect no dangerous substances. I used the key card pattern scanned from the lock to program the drill. It should now be able to make a template of the key card in the rock. This box contains old wire and connectors. The laser drill has cut a template for the keycard in the stone. This is a keycard made from the triphosphorate silver rock. This appears to be the brain of Scythe. There are two identical but isolated computers that communicate with a third, which controls the launch of missiles. This door is marked with a radiation hazard symbol. Missiles of death and destruction. The Luker believed that you could never have enough of them. This computer controls the launch of missiles. It is directly controlled by the other computers. This computer is marked with the last letter of the Luker alphabet. This computer is marked with the first letter of the Luker alphabet. Greetings, 
indicate an extremely high radiation level beyond those doors. It would be fatal to proceed beyond them. A crude uranium-235 nuclear device with lithium-beryllium shells to increase heavy particle fallout. A crude uranium-235... This computer directly controls the missile launch system. There is no way to interface with it directly, but the other two computers are accessible. A crude uranium-235 nuclear... A crude uranium-235... This computer is functional and performing an average 0.75 million operations per second. This computer is functional and performing an average 1.2 million operations per second. twins, but they are not identical. It appears they are out of sync, Captain. I have to assume the Alpha unit has a virus, which is using up an incredible amount of computing time. They report different optimum launch times, which is right. Given the elliptical orbit and the range at which they will pass Proxtry, the Omega unit is correct, but the window is very narrow. A variation of minutes will mean the missiles run out of fuel and fall harmlessly into the sun. Can you reprogram the Lucas computer to give us that time, Mr. Spock? Reprogramming an old alien computer is not simple, Captain. The odds against success are 10,221 to 1 against. Too bad all Omega here couldn't just take a sick day and miss the firing. Because the two machines are isolated, the virus did not spread from one to the other. If we could only bridge them. A length of wire with some sort of connector at each end. The connector snaps into place. missiles will run out of fuel before they reach Proxtry. They will drift into the sun and burn up. Kirk to Enterprise, how are the transporters, Scotty? They're operational again, Captain. We're ready to bring you back at any time. Bring us home. Message from Starfleet. On screen, Lieutenant. We have read your report on the problems at Proxima 3 and evaluate your performance at 100%. You and your crew received four commendation points. A perfect mission, Jim. You are a model for all Starfleet. Hard to believe that Earth came so close to the brink itself. Vulcans, too. Both, in the end, looked into the abyss and came to the only logical conclusion. Logic? Humans? I'm dreaming, Jim. Sometimes it is harder and braver to make peace rather than war. Sounds like emotion had its part to play in a positive sense, too. I don't know about you, but I'd like to bid an emotional goodbye to Alpha Proxima myself. Take us out of orbit, Mr. Sewell. 